Good evening. This meeting of the Jefferson County Board will now come to order. Roll call, please. Am I here? We have six absent and 24 present. Thank you. All rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Mr. Wehmeyer, would you please lead us? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You're invited to remain standing for a moment to contemplate our service to the public. Thank you. Yeah. Are we in compliance with open meeting law? We're in compliance, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Next is approval of the agenda. Would anybody uh, like the order of the agenda altered in any way? Okay, we'll proceed as printed. Next is approval of the March 22, 2019 meeting minutes. Supervisor Renard, please. Move approval of the minutes as presented. Second. Moved and seconded to approve the minutes as presented. Discussion? All in favor, say aye. Aye. Op opposed, no. The minutes are approved. Next is a special order of business, presentation on results of the communication study report from Ehlert and Associates. Okay, a couple month, couple months ago, um, um, associate and I were were here to conduct a assessment of your uh, public safety communications radio system. Okay, and so we um, did a number of things um, uh, as far as interviewing people and going to your sites. But I'm going to first start with a, a short agenda here. Um, I'm just going to kind of review. Our Ellard and Associates. Um, was is the name of our firm, but we were purchased by a uh, a uh, sister company this last year, and so I was just going to run through that real, real, real quick, uh, but then go through what is a radio system assessment, just briefly go through st the sh uh, share stakeholders, uh, do a systems review, um, the system issues that we found, and. Um, Go through the solutions and the options that we are uh, proposing that you consider. Um, go through some immediate concerns, next steps, and then question and answers. So I'm going to try to do this relatively quickly. El like Ellert and Associates was established in 1984, and in 2014, assist some of our uh, um, consultants that lived in uh, Austin, Texas, they decided to go out on their own. And in 19 or 2018, our owner decided to retire, and so our sister company purchased us. So we we come up part of True North. It's Ellard and Associates, part of True North Company. So that's just a short uh, little synopsis on the car company. Um, what is a communications uh, radio communications assessment? Um, we review the voice channels, the paging, frequency assignments that you use. Um, the equipment, shelters, towers, um, backup power, environmentals, backhaul. Backhaul is like microwave and fiber. Um, do a field unit inventory. We've asked all of the agencies to provide how many units, how many portables, 
mobiles and uh, bases and pagers that they had. Um, and then we interviewed the stakeholders. Um, what do they think of the system? Does it work for them? What needs to be improved? That's basically what, what we, we go through with them. Um, and then on step two of this conceptual, or the, uh, the system assessment, we go through some conceptual, we come up with some conceptual designs. Um, and so we usually provide three, and we did that in this case. But we go through the voice, paging, microwave, backhaul, uh, think, or look at the technologies that are being used, and also what the portable coverage requirements are. In public safety, portals become, has become the, the uh, uh, equipment that public safety uses. 40, 50 years ago, it was a mobile, okay? And most sites were built, and they, they took whatever they could get for coverage. They put it a, they'd put a tower on a hill or make it, put an antenna on a structure on a hill, and they take what they get. Today's systems are designed. We've, we have propagation tools that we can choose locations, and we can determine what the coverage is really, really close, not compared to what it used to be. So anyway, that's, that's the kind of uh, uh, design uh, that, it, that is put into a radio system. There's also capacity. Um, if, you were, if we were going to use a trunking system, which is a shared channel system, we would have to go out and find out how many channels do we need to be able to accommodate all the users. In this case, we're, we didn't recommend trunking, but we, that's one of our um, options, the conceptual options. Um, and then we, we talk about civil work a little bit. Once you build a, or once you decide what your radio system need to, needs to do, you got to go out and find the structures that will handle all of the antennas and all the equipment that you're going to try to put on this system. And uh, many times this, the towers, once you put the antennas on, they could be overloaded. So we have a structural engineer that we recommend that actually does analysis on there to f determine if the system can actually support, um, the tower can actually support the system that you want. Uh, we also look at uh, um, power backup power, um, generators, things like that. Um, then we generate, a, from that, from that, those conceptual designs, we'll uh, establish or generate a budgetary estimate, what they might be. And most of our budgetary estimates are, they're probably conservative. Um, and uh, they, they try to encompass most of what you're gonna run to, minus any of that, if you need to do, and let's say, yeah, let's say you need to, uh, tower you want to use, you need to you need to strengthen it. That's probably not included. We don't know what those costs are. Um, but then we, after we do the con uh, conceptual designs, we, we make a recommendation based on what we feel your technical needs are, and then uh, we go to we try to de determine what your next step should be. So here are your stakeholders. You got about 1,250 mobiles, portables control stations and 500, a little over 500 pagers at the using system. And the list of all the agencies are on the right hand side there. Um, most of these that we either met with, we had we had two meetings, law enforcement meeting and a fire meeting, uh, which I think include most of these, most of these people. And we got uh, um, the inventory from almost every agency. So it might not be a short, a few, a few units, but in most part, this represents the units that you have in your system today. So here are the channels that you have in your system today. There's two law channels, law one and NCOM one. And uh, there's fire one channel, uh, an iPhone channel, a mark repeater, um, a highway, and you have paging. Um, the law one, NCOM one, and um, the iPhone and mark one and highway they're all a single single repeater or a single base station or repeater at the Jefferson site. The Fire One channel has two sites, one in Watertown, one in Jefferson. And the paging has transmit sites on every one of these sites on the picture. They had nine sites. Now for all of these other um, the law one through highway, or law one through mark one, I should say, they have receivers at all those sites as well. So you can receive from any of those, but you're only going to transmit on one. So it allows portables, in this case, to be able to talk back into dispatch, but 
going the outbound signal from dispatch is probably weak because there's only one transmitter on the whole system. On um, the system, from, from a system issues point of view, the paging system is the is the thing that needs to be taken care of. The current microwave, it's really unstable. Um, not uh, it, the this microwave system is used for backhaul. In other words, everything that goes on at these sites is backhauled or sent back to Jefferson. On the receive side, they have a voter there that's votes votes the best site to both repeat or send a dispatch or both. And um, on the uh, um, paging side, there's, you're sending out the pages through every site. Now the microwave system isn't sending the same signal level to each of the sites. And so when they transmit to the pager, it's the interference. Unless they're really, really close to a site, a transmitter, it's, it's interference. And so it don't work. Okay? Um, so that once that was one of the things that needs to be corrected. Um, the other item is their stations that they use is a Harris Master 3. They've been out of production and out of, out of uh, uh, service with the manufacturer since 2017. So they, they need to be replaced. Um, so Mar going further on the, on the microwave, I talked about, we talked about the stability, but there's also a combination of analog and digital being used. Capo stations are all running in analog right now, but the uh, MUX or the MUX multiplexer is not letting it work properly. Um, moving into the future, we would suggest that everything would be go to digital. Um, it would provide more capacity on the microwave. Um, right now, you can see the way the, uh, let's see, oh, I got too many things here. Right now, the Jefferson has a hub and spoke type of microwave system. These red ones are an old, older technology, they're the analog. And then they have digital ones or digital capable ones on the screen. So these don't really need to be play, replaced, but these do. And if it was all digital, uh, your, your microwave system would become more stable again. The other item, and I put it on thing, is that the Jefferson County Tower, or the Jefferson Tower, may be at capacity or even overloaded. So this is what's on the tower today. A lot of that stuff uh, should be removed or could be removed with a new design. But uh, today, it's, they, they don't want to put really any more on it because they don't know what the capacity of that, it, that tower is. So the other item that uh, on their system is all the voice channels. So uh, again, the Master 3 station is used there that needs to be, needs to be replaced with something else because they're past end of life. Um, and then most of the, from a, from a voice system, a single, a single transmitter is not going to cut it for performance for a public safety system. Um, you should have multiple transmitters across the county that all, that will all work together to improve overall performance of the, uh, of the radio system. This is what coverage looks like today from our predictions. Um, you'll see the, uh, on the left is a single, um, there's a, a green, green area would represent portable in-building residential structures. Yellow would represent probably outdoor. Again, it's uh, portable on your hip with 95% coverage of the county with 95% reliability. Many of the many of the uh, people that we've talked to said that we didn't think it was you know they thought that the system worked fairly well, but it, the reason our our, uh, our coverage is probably reduced is because of that reliability. This is most systems that are designed anymore today so that you can you can tolerate uh, the storm uh, anything that could reduce performance again with the radio on your hip on your belt. Um, and talking with a, a microphone. So um, now the right hand side is the receivers. So you got receiving capability all across the county. So they're unbalanced. The transmit and receive are not balanced. So you can only do as good as the, 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 uh, 
um, the one on the left because that's all they can hear. If you're trying to talk in building, they're not going to be able to talk. They're not going to be able to hear dispatch. Dispatch may be able to hear them, but they can't hear dispatch. So other system issue issues, uh, backup power. A um, few sites had battery backup uh, where they had a 12 volt lead acid battery, so if power went off. They could power it while before the generator would come on if there was a generator there. There was a few sites that didn't have generator operation. Um, there's some RF grounding techniques that were used. They're older. They've been updated. That should probably be implemented because that protects both the equipment and pe personnel from surges. If you get a million volts that comes down from a lightning strike, you want to try to drain much, as much of that off as possible. A lot of this equipment anymore runs on 3 to 5 volts. So if it, if it is, uh, is it hit with anything more than probably 12 or 15 volts, it'll, it'll burn stuff up in the, in the stations. Um, there's a few licensing issues uh, that I found that needs to be corrected. Uh, alarms, there's alarms on some, of the equipment, on some of the sites, but not all. That all should, if there's a failure someplace, someone at dispatch should know that that's happening. And then also the field, um, the maintenance people should know it. So those systems are all available. There's also intermodulation, and intermodulation is a combination of transmitters. Every, every tra if there's two or more transmitters, they intermix together and they form new frequencies. And there was a couple of instances where I found that the receiver, these, these uh, couple of transmitters came on, and I, I, uh, I think it was, it was a law and a, an iFern channel and something else, but it it, it, it had, uh, in fire and interfered with the fire channel. So if all those three transmitters are up at the same time, it may have impact the performance of the fire channel. So um, that's what intermodulation is. But that, that needs to be checked all the way through at every site. Um, so solutions, and I'm sorry if I'm rushing, if anybody's got a question, please um, speak up. Um, enhancements, would we make it all digital? Okay. Uh, currently, it's an, there's an analog component. They may, they run it as analog, but some stations are lo are capable of digital. But if it was all digital, these things, these issues with the amplitude and the uh, simulcast would go away. Um, the other thing is hands relance reliability. You notice on this on this uh, diagram, it's a loop, it's a ring. These green all connected together. And when when you do that, if any of the links break, the network itself would recognize that and go the other direction. So it may be running, let's say, clockwise and getting all its information clockwise. Let's say one breaks. It says, I'm broke. So then it goes to the other way. So you don't lose anything when something like this happens, uh, as long as one only one failure occurs. Now, the one the link I have there with a circle in it, that circle indicates an area that might not be able to have, provide that link. In your current uh, radio firm, recognize that, has recognized that, and wouldn't put that in there. This is, like I said, this was kind of an example for everybody to uh, consider, but the ring provides redundancy and increases reliability. So on voice systems, you, get, you gotta look at a couple things. Technology is one. Is it gonna run analog or digital? First, today you run analog. New public safety systems run on digital. Um, it provides better performance. It sounds, from the user point of view, every every transmission is crystal clear until the radio can no longer decode the digital signal, and then you have nothing. It just goes dark because there's no no audio. Um, so that's one of the choices. Conventional or trunked? Um, trunked is when you share a number of frequencies together. Conventional is one. Every agency has their own channel. So Law La One was a, a one channel, and Encom One's their own channel. Fire One, one, one is the one channel. Um, so that is that is a choice to make. Um, simulcast, which is simultaneously transmitting on the same frequency at multiple sites, opposed to um, using different frequencies at every, every site, or using a tech uh, using a, a code to bring up one site at a time. All of those have been used. We wouldn't recommend anything but simulcast. It's just, you, number one is you operate on VHF, 
you're not going to find the frequencies um, to do that. And then voting, as we already did, it should be voted. Um, there's bands of operation, like I said, that you currently operate on VHF. There is UHF bands, there's 800 bands. Some of your neighbors um, to the east use 800, to the south uses 800. Um, it's a different frequency, take, it requires different radios, um, unless you have a multi-band type of radio, which is more, of ex more expensive. Um, so anyway, in our, uh, in our study, we, we did three conventional or, uh, conceptual designs. The first one, it was an analog, and let's say you do simulcast on multiple sites um, to improve your outbound coverage. But basically leave the same, uh, improve the microwave, but leave it the same. The second one is use a P25 digital type of system for, for voice. The, the uh, paging would stay uh, analog, uh, but, but uh, simulcast and with the new, new microwave. And number three was a trunking, trunking sl solution that, that would switch everything to 800 megahertz. So let's just go through the first one. Um, in our conceptual design, we felt that you only needed really six sites. Now you got nine available, but only six sites you really need for operation. But you'd still use the nine sites for, let's say, receiving uh, iFern and Mark One. Um, you'd use nine sites for paging. You'd have all nine sites connected via microwave. Um, the uh, topology or the scub pub, hub and spoke uh, in this particular design, I just I left them the way it is. Um, that way, you'd only have one microwave station at every one of the every one of the nodes, except for at Jefferson, or uh, because you'd have to have them all on that one. Um, DC battery plant. Instead of running your your system on commercial AC power, you'd run them on batteries, and have the batteries being charged. If you had a power failure, nobody would ever know it. You would just alarm and send it back and send somebody out to, well, if they needed to, monitor the commercial power. In, in every other, in, in, in this case, there should be a generator on site. It would come on after about 30, 30 to 45 seconds so that you didn't have to worry about the batteries ever running down. Most of these battery plants, we spec them for 20 to 30 minutes of operation. So you got about that long. So if there's something else that you needed to do, if, uh, if a generator failed and you had an extra one that you could haul to the site, and plug it in, you could, you could still do that. Um, I, in each of these designs, put in three, I put this shelter, uh, three shelters in this one, at main, the main site, Fort Atkinson and Palmyra. Um, I've got two towers in the, in the budgetary figure. Um, all new grounding, all this stuff is new. All of this, uh, the equipment is new. And I, the budgetary figure came out to 4.94 um, million dollars million dollars. Um, for the second option, and this is the one that we recommended was a digital simulcast, um, conventional operation. So it'd be another six sites um, for transmit that would be transmit and receive. Nine sites would be for receive on MyFern and Mark. Uh, nine sites for paging. That part never uh, never changed. The paging part never changes. The, the microwave would be in a ring, opposed to a star. Um, again, three shelters, two towers, a grounding system, and that one would require new radios. So that's why most of it increased. It went to digital, and uh, radios have to go to digital. And so that one, the budgetary figure was nine point nine point seven three million. For option three, it was a trunking system. You'd be converted to eight hundred. Uh, you would need all new radios, but it would be 10 sites. As you go up in frequency, you just can't, can't the, the uh, distance that you can go is a little bit reduced, and uh, it gives you better in-building penetration, but uh, overall, uh, we felt you'd probably need 10 sites in order to get the 95% operate, or 95% coverage. Um, we put in one transmit and receive site for Eifert and Mark, because Mark is a repeater, iFern's a fire base. Um, new digital uh, microwave ring, DC battery again, three shelters, five towers, um, and grounding system. And then that, that one, it has all new radios, 800 megahertz, um, and that one came in at 18.16. Now, these figures are all 
they're they're inflated on purpose. They they include contingency, all the civil. They 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 include the civil, what we know as civil engineering, but not all of the. If you needed to um, uh, strengthen a tower, we don't know what that would be. So those that figure isn't in there. But every we try to put it as much as possible into these, so you can get an idea of what it may cost. Can it be done cheaper? Certainly, certainly. You may not need shelters everywhere we say shelters. You may not need towers It's if it can be done that way. Uh, another thing on solutions is portables. What kind of portable operation you need? This is probably the next step that you need to decide. What kind of portable or what kind of performance does your system have to have? What kind of county coverage? Is it on the hip or up on your, you know, up, up higher? Is it city, um, indoor? Is it rural, outdoor? Because you can choose any of these. Um, many public safety uses indoor, indoor for uh, uh, city, and, pro and some of them use outdoor. That could uh, that could be outdoor and commercial, or indoor and commercial buildings in the city, and indoor residential everywhere else in the county. So they, that has to be determined. So you can define a spec to give a potential vendor. Um, these are these are uh, uh, equipment counts based on what that went into the uh, budgets, um, based on uh, high, mid, and low tier equipment. High tier was law enforcement. Mid tier is fire. Low tier is public service, like the highways. Okay, it just the higher tier, the higher tier equipment. Uh, you see at the bottom of the higher tier, it has encryption on it. So I added encryption, okay, uh, to every one of the law enforcement radios. It doesn't have, it isn't on the fire ones and it's not on the highway ones. Um, so any new purchase we feel need to, you really need to have P25 capability. You shouldn't buy a radio without it uh, because uh, digital is a public safety standard. The P25 is a public safety standard. And uh, most radio and, the, and most grants and uh, uh, for sources of funds require that before otherwise you don't qualify um, one of the things that we would recommend is that every radio in the system is checked annually some of the radios are never checked unless something they know that it's broke but radios can change radios their parameters can change and they can cause system problems that can't be that they can cause problems with communications but uh, you know you just you don't know where the what it is which which piece of this system is creating the problem? But by having an annual checkup, you keep them all as as uh, finely tuned as you possibly can. Um, the other thing, and, I, and some of this has already been done, uh, channel naming convention. Just channel names can cause a gigantic problem if everybody isn't using the same names. Uh, there are examples of having um, different names for the same channel and users didn't know what to do or where to go and so that's something that really needs to be done there's national and state channels all of these have been defined and all those things should be in the radios the radio should be programmed by a qualified personnel and periodic training of all the radio users should happen to make sure they understand how to use the radio um, potential civil work all antenna structures that once define what the spec is for your system design and proposers come in and give you a proposal every site that they did they ask you to use should be should be uh, uh, analyzed to ensure that that structure is going to take the load and um, once you do that you got some degree of, of, of assurance that that will happen now it'll probably take the load and you could probably build something and take a load in the summer but when all the ice and everything gets on it in the winter that's where the really loading comes in um, there's some equipment shelters um, we would recommend that the site grounding there are different things that you can do there to ensure the compound is grounded and safe uh, immediate action improve that microwave network get that get that where it needs to be, and then improve and enhance the voice systems. This is more of the in, in, 
the uh, as you go forward here, once you get everything decided, bring get that uh, microwave system going so you can get the paging going. Um, so the next steps: define and document system specifications. Determine what kind of procurement methodology you want to use. Get get proposals from uh, vendors. Choose one. Negotiate the contract. Award it, and then do a have them do a detailed design so that you can assure that what they've built or what they've designed is going to work for you. And then part of that is they're going to have to demonstrate that what they've built actually does what it says it does. Okay, and then go through the civil and the construction thing. But I mean it's a real quick synopsis of our study. So. Any, any questions? Any questions? Supervisor Renard. Thank you for your report. Thank you for your report. Um, I'm assuming that once the system is upgraded, mm -hmm. everybody will need a new radio, right? That will In, work you, on the upgraded system? If you follow, follow the recommendation, yes, they would all have to have a digital radio. Okay. There may be some digital radios out there, but it depends on their age and what their capabilities are. Okay. So how possible. much? How much does one of those new radios cost? It there's it 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 is all over the map. It's you can get a radio for uh, as much as six thousand uh -huh. dollars, or you can probably get a radio as much as uh, twelve to fifteen hundred dollars. Okay, and everywhere in between. It all depends on how you have them outfitted. And what vendor you use? Now, P25 is a standard, so everybody has to meet meet the standard, and they all have to show compliance to the standard. So you can virtually get any radio you want, as long as you stick with the standard. Uh, the radio should work on your system. Now, not all radios are equal, so it's something that you really should uh, uh, do some maybe do some testing on and uh, have a radio that you start out with. If somebody wants to bring in another radio that they want you to consider, run it through a battery of tests, make sure there works for you. Um, but it's, uh, and this is mobile and portable I'm talking about. I mean, they're, they can get very expensive. Like a multi-band, the hot top end would be a multi-band. They would do VHF 800 or maybe VHF UHF having 800. Um, they would do all of those. That may be something that you wanna have for certain certain uh, personnel, so that you can uh, have interoperability with your neighbors, because some of your neighbors have 800 P25. Any other yeah. questions? Yeah. Supervisor Christensen. Thank you. Um, I believe you said there would be a possibility for a number of towers. Those would be new towers. No, um, what has been what has been proposed? Well, there's some new new towers. Okay, there's some in the towers that I had recommended that were new are either replacements for water tower sites or towers that don't have the height today to uh, to probably to you have you know to to provide the performance that you'd be looking for, that we look for in our design. Okay. Um, water towers may be may be able to be used, but in most cases, the um, when you divide when you design a system, you you'll have multiple channels, so it's multiple transmitters, and then multiple receivers, and you put an antenna for receivers, and you have an antenna for transmitters, and you usually put the an receiver antenna on top, and the transmitter underneath it, but the distance between those two, there's got to be there's an isolation factor. If the isolation factor can't be met with the with the antennas that you're currently using, the only way to increase it is to vertically increase it. Water towers is not a good way of doing that. That's why I, that's why towers. But well, the reason I asked that, I wanted to ask you about the potential for using those towers for other purposes, uh, possibly broadband uh, uses. You certainly could. If they certainly were our could. towers, for yeah, instance. Yeah, you certainly could. I mean, there's there's many many of our clients. They try to put cellular 
cellular carriers on. And so any other any any other uh, service like that could be designed into the system. Thank you. That's what yep. I want to know. Other questions? Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Waymire. So I know it's a lot to take in tonight, um, but this is a big project, and I know <clears throat> many of you had constituents and stakeholders that were mentioned tonight who brought concerns as we look forward for a final solution. So. There's a lot more work to come from this study. We actually met with the stakeholders for almost two hours this afternoon um, to present uh, a longer presentation with more technical data of how it uh, operates within the systems. Um, part of that was talking about the radios. So if you, um, when you look at this report, uh, a good chunk of that big dollar amount is for new radios. It's not for the sites themselves. So we start having a conversation with our partners of how do we plan budgetary-wise with them for the future as well. Uh, we put aside over $1.2 million in this fiscal year to move this project forward. Uh, obviously, we got some more work to do in terms of how the remain were finance. Our intent is, priority-wise, is get the microwave system he talked about and the paging system working because that's our biggest need right now. Um, and then we're going to continue to look at how we move things forward. Now, one comment I will make because it came up this afternoon and our consultant talked about it. What we're proposing is not a Band-Aid approach that was asked today. This is us creating a brand new system to meet the demands and requirements of the modern public safety um, communication system. So if you're asked, what is the system going to do? It is basically we're doing surgery on our system to get it the place it needs to be. So on case, and, and obviously um, Sheriff, Chief, Todd, myself are available for questions afterwards. Um, but more to come. But because of the scope of this, we thought it was important to have the consultant give you uh, the first-hand account of what he found out, not just coming from staff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. We now move to communications. County Clerk Audrey McGraw, do we have any communications this evening? Yes, we do. Um, so in your packets, you should find the treasurer's report. You will also see the appointments that the county board chair has made to the broadband working group and to the comprehensive plan steering committee. Also included is zoning committee's notice of public hearing, which is April 18th, 2019 at 7 p.m. And lastly, an email that Chairman Schrader received this afternoon in support of the parks committee's two resolutions that are on tonight's agenda. That's it. Thank you. And we also, for communications, we have some retirement recognitions. Terry Palm Kostrowski, our Human Resources Director. Thank you. Um, we have seven retirements, and with that, not one of them, I should say the, the least amount of time one person has, was here was 17 years which tells you what I went over in my annual report last year, and I'll cover again next month, is we have, uh, our workforce has a lot of individuals <coughs> that are uh, looking at retiring soon. Um, and so that is one of the, the challenges that we're going to have, even though we're very happy for our retirees as they're able to move on into the next stages <coughs> of their life. So I just want to recognize, we do have one here tonight, so I want to recognize the others first, and I'm going to ask Sheriff Milbroth to please come up and um, present our last one with his plaque and say a few words. Um, Holly Diekman Radloff was with the county for 17 and a half years in our parks department. Many of you know Connie Freeberg. We recognized her a couple of meetings ago with the Corp Council's office for 18 and a half years. Diane Lenz was a public health nurse who worked in the jail for just over 20 years. Uh, Carla Robinson, uh, who worked in our clerk of courts, our DA's office, and then back as the clerk of courts, spent almost 27 years with the county. Mark Watkins, many of you also know, he recently retired. He was with the county for just over 29 years from our land and water conservation department. And then Greg Winter from our highway department, who was the accounting manager there for almost 33 years. So with that, Sheriff, would you mind coming up?
25.7 if you'd have stayed at least as long as I said you'd have had 26. <laughs> Couldn't make it. <laughs> um, Randy, on behalf of the county, first off, uh, here's this nice little plaque cutting board and then a certificate of retirement recognition. Um, Randy, in all honesty, this is not Randy's thing uh, to get up here, so I promised him I'd do my best to embarrass him, but I, <laughs> I won't. Um, I have to say one thing. Randy has been with the Sheriff's Office for almost 26 years. Um, Randy kept our squad cars in, in excellent shape. Sometimes he had to do a lot of things that uh, <laughs> patching mufflers. Um, Randy knows how cheap I am. He fixed one of my mufflers with a grapefruit can and two clamps. He said, because I was a sheriff, I got two clamps. Um, <laughs> it is a true story. Uh, <coughs> I think I put three more years on that system. Yep. Bottom line is, though, uh, Randy did a lot for us. Um, a lot of agencies were not fortunate like we are. Randy didn't just make sure that the little things got fixed. Randy did everything. Randy put the lights on. Randy put the propane on. Randy did everything with those cars. Uh, There's nothing that he didn't know. We had people call from across the country asking Randy's advice on propane and how they work in vehicles. So that was pretty, <coughs> to me, that's pretty amazing that we had that luck. Um, my only jealousy here is number one, he's gone. Number two, look how tan he is already by compared. When, when we kept him down in the garage, he stayed nice and, you know, sun. <laughs> I was worried about his, you know, his complexion and skin, not you know, any issues there. <laughs> Randy, thank you so much. Chairman Schrader. Supervisor Nass, please. I just wanted to add, uh, who'd have thought this when I met Randy in kindergarten in 1959? <laughs> Congratulations, Randy. <laughs> okay, we have one more communication this evening. This one um, from Supervisor White. I'll read it. Mr. Chair, as you know, I proudly serve in the Wisconsin Army National Guard as a field artillery officer. As such, I have been ordered to attend military training in Fort Sill, Oklahoma from June 7, 2019 until November 26, 2019. For that purpose, I will be out of the state during those dates. Since I fully intend to return to my supervisory district once my military orders have concluded, my absence will not constitute a vacancy of my seat on the county board. After conferring with Corporation Council, it is my understanding that the county board chair may appoint another county board member to temporarily fill my committee slots until I return, at which point I may resume my place on those committees. During my residency at Fort Sill, I will have regular access to my phone and email, so my constituents may continue to contact me by email or phone, and I will respond to them to the extent that I am able. I wish the best to Jefferson County and the county board while I am away. I eagerly look forward to returning to Wisconsin after finishing my military training. Sincerely, Brandon White, County Supervisor, District 18. That concludes uh, communications. Now we go to public comment. We have one registrant this evening, Emmy Reiner of Madison on the alcohol awareness. Good evening, my name is Emmy Reiner. I'm a public health nurse at the Jefferson County Health Department. Um, I don't live in Jefferson County, but I serve the county and um, I also serve as the chair of the Jefferson County Drug-Free Coalition. And I wanna thank you um, tonight for, later on the agenda, um, for proclaiming this month as Alcohol Use Awareness Month. And I think this um, topic of alcohol use and abuse doesn't get as much airtime um, as we sometimes give it. So I just wanted to mention why this topic is so important to me and to the people um, of this community. Um, well, first of all, I want to say that this campaign um, is a national campaign. It's really to bring awareness 
um, to alcohol abuse and misuse um, so that people who are um, suffering from alcohol use addictions can get the support they need because we want to reduce the stigma um, with this disease as much as we can. Um, but I'd like to put a local spin on it here today and focus on underage use um, because that is really important to our community. We want every young person in our community to have the chance to succeed. Um, and we know that alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs um, really don't get young people where they want to be in life. So why is this so important? Well, alcohol is one of the top five most addictive substances that we know of um, after heroin and amphetamines, cocaine, and nicotine. And once that addi addiction takes hold, it really has a powerful effect on people, as you probably know. Um, in our communities, we have done surveys through the schools, and about 30% of high school students still drink alcohol on a regular basis. And even though that's really down from you know, 20 years ago, that's still a significant number that we should um, be aware of. And when you combine that with other high-risk behaviors that young people engage in, um, we should really be concerned about that as well. Um, thirdly, I want to say that youth who begin drinking before the age of 14 years of age um, have a 41% chance of, of developing an alcohol use disorder. Um, however, if they wait till age 21, they have a 10% chance, um, and that's about the same as the general population. So um, encouraging our young people to wait until age 21 is really a worthwhile thing to do. Um, so I want to mention what we're doing here this month and through the rest of the year. Um, our coalition is really focusing on underage alcohol use prevention. Uh, we're distributing education through the schools, um, letting parents know that, you know, that to encourage them to start talking about alcohol uses with other important subjects. Um, we're encouraging our local law enforcement to um, step up efforts to prevent uh, retail access to alcohol products. Um, we've been on the radio talking about this subject. Um, we're also offering small mini grants to our Jefferson County um, Connections, which is the Positive Youth Development Organization, um, and they'll be um, putting forth some campaigns around drug use and alcohol use later in the year. Um, and lastly, I think we're going to be doing uh, an alcohol use education forum by the end of this year, and we have a small grant to do that with the coalition. So thank you so much um, for your time and for um, proclaiming April as Alcohol Use Awareness Month. Thank you. That concludes public comment for this evening. Now we go to annual reports. Our first is from uh, Clerk of Court Cindy Hamry Incha. I believe this is her first annual report. <laughs> Don't be nervous. <laughs> Good evening, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to supplement the 2018 report submitted on behalf of the Clerk of Court Circuit Court's Office. To begin with, my name is Cindy Hamri Incha, and I was sworn in as the elected Clerk of Circuit Courts on January 7th of this year, making today my 99th day as the elected clerk. <laughs> That being said, I've been with the office for over 20 years, and in that time, I have been in almost every position in the office. While I would love to say that the transition has been seamless, I'm happy to report that my biggest obstacles so far have been relating to getting on the necessary email lists and getting the right computer authorities within the county's computer system. The written sub report submitted includes a brief summary of the offices included within the Clerk of Court's budget, along with some general information about the responsibilities, functions, and financial transactions of each office. Beyond questions that you may have, I will do my best to avoid repeating information already provided in the written report. The duties, obligations, and procedural requirements of the Clerk of Circuit Court's office are ever-changing. We're impacted by law changes, changes in court officials, judicial rotations, state budgets, county budgets, technology changes from the Director of State Court's office, to name a few. The biggest recent changes relate to transitioning to e-filing and converting to the State Debt Collection, or SDC. The e-filing rule was enacted in Wisconsin Statute Section 80118 and became effective July 1, 2016. Interface development and implementation is on a schedule established by the Director of State Court's office. E-filing has changed almost every aspect of record keeping for the office. 
The final phase of impl implementation is scheduled to occur statewide by the end of this year. As each phase of e-filing has rolled out, Jefferson County has offered to pilot the new functionality and has consistently been on the forefront of implementation. Recent statutory changes also allowed the office to transition to use of the state desk collection. In the last two years, more than 12,000 cases with outstanding or old debt were converted to SDC in addition to adding new cases to collections as it became appropriate. Those efforts resulted in more than $500,000 being collected on cases in 2018 alone. In, in addition to those impressive results, it's also important to note that unlike other debt collection agencies that have been used in the past, there is no cost incurred by the county for collections actions taken by SDC. I'm glad to report that the office has transitioned so well to and so early to e-filing and SDC collection because new significant changes are coming. Locally, the judges are working on a judicial rotation plan that will likely adjust and impact distribution of cases and scheduling of all cases in an effort to better balance overall case weight and improve timely access to the courts. On a statewide level, legislative changes that, if implemented, will impact significantly on the courts. Legislation related to expungement of some criminal cases already passed the Assembly and the Senate. Expungement is something that we are asked about on an almost daily basis, and until now, availability and application was very narrow. If signed, the volume of people eligible to come back to the courts and petition for expungement of their criminal convictions is staggering. The law change is applicable to all misdemeanors and some felony cases retroactively and applicable even if the conviction is so old that the file has been destroyed. First time petitioners may file without a fee and unless the individual is ineligible by statute, a hearing is to occur. If denied, another petition may be filed after a two year waiting period with a $100 filing fee. If denied twice, no additional petition can be filed. If so if signed, this law will bring with it significant volume of work into the court system. Currently, there's also a lot of discussion relating to OWI laws. Some proposed legislation versions will make first offense violations criminal misdemeanors with the option of expungement and conversion to forfeiture violations if there are no subsequent violations within a five-year period. Other proposals would require mandatory court appearances for first offense with financial penalties for non-appearances. These proposals are all relatively early in the legislative process, but it should be noted that all proposals require additional layers of court action. Some in estimates indicate that changes to the OWI first offense being criminal would have a statewide financial impact of more than $15 million annually. That would include statewide need of approximately 15 new judges, 42 new assistant district attorneys, 22 probation agents, and an unknown number of state public defenders. I note this because in one financial estimate narrative, I found the following note. Additional circuit court proceedings, as would be required under this proposal, would require additional court staff, injury time, costs that are borne to the counties. These costs would vary by county, but are estimate estimated to be significant for every county. While I'm optimistic that the system can absorb the influx of work created by the expungement changes, I am concerned that the OWI law changes with expungement may cause me to be back before you looking for additional resources for staff. I would like to talk to you about the staff. I can't say enough about the staff in these offices. They're dedicated, skilled professionals that not only deal with a lot of difficult people and difficult subject matter on a daily basis, but they also have been working short staff for a very long time. They step up whenever there is need and all too often they schedule and adjust and forego their time off to ensure that the courts are properly served. In the 12 years that Carla was clerk, we were fully staffed one day. Becoming fully staffed and maintaining quality trained staff is a priority for me. In addition to becoming fully staffed, I hope to provide additional tools and support in the form of training on a quarterly basis, starting with Narcan training on May 29th, followed by Stop the Bleed training with the assistance of Fort Atkinson Hospital staff, and then verbal de-escalation. From the last meeting, now that Barb and Carlo, Carla have both retired, I would like to propose that we reevaluate the good clerk, bad clerk designations. <laughs>
Well, I acknowledge that we deal with a very few happy occasions down at my end of the building. I don't know that we need to jump to that making me the bad clerk right off the bat. I deal with a lot of criminals, but in today's current state, Audrey deals with politics. <laughs> Maybe something we can revisit in the future. <laughs> And lastly, and also from the last meeting, I would like to say a special thank you to Supervisor Jekyll for his warm welcome and words of encouragement after the meeting. I mentioned to him that I was observing to get a sense of what these presentations look like, and he assured me that I would do fine, and that he and his colleague in the back would be tailoring the number of times that I said, um, so that was nothing I needed to be concerned about. My sincere thanks for that. Again, thank you for your time, and I welcome any questions. Any questions? Thank you for your report, and we'll start with the assumption that we have two good clerks. <laughs> thank you. Our next report is from Corporation Counsel Jay Blair Ward. Good evening, Blair Ward Corporation Counsel with the 2018 Corporation Counsel Annual Report. Depending on how long you've been on the county board and depending on how many committees you've served on, some of you may be more familiar than others with the services that my office provides. For example, if you're on the finance committee, you know all about tax foreclosures. If you're on the human services board, you're familiar with chapter 51 commitments. I'm going to elaborate on some of the services provided my, by my office that are high profile services and serve the public. Normally with me, I serve you as county board supervisors answering legal questions. I'll give legal advice to the county board chair, the county administrator, department head staff, but normally I don't reach out to the community. Once in a while I do, but primarily I'm in-house legal counsel to Jefferson County. That's not the case with all the attorneys in my office. I have, gen generally my office is a chief legal advisor to the county. That's statutorily mandated. It's also in our county board rules. Draft resolutions and ordinances. Every resolution before you tonight went through my office to re be reviewed for legal sufficiency, went through the finance director for any fiscal impact, and the county administrator to make sure it's appropriately before the county board. Serena from my office is our county board reporter, paralegal, makes sure that the minutes from the county board are properly published in the newspaper, also required by law. One of the areas that I'm gonna focus on tonight deals with chapter 51 mental health commitments. Now, mental health commitments is an area of law which is authorized, which authorizes my office to detain individuals in the community involuntarily if there's a need for involuntary mental health treatment. And that keeps Attorney Azarwell busy almost all the time. That's how busy our office is. If you look at the handout that I have, you'll see that 167 commitments were prosecuted in 2018. Once I tell you what in, is involved with a mental health commitment, you'll understand how busy Attorney Zarwell is in prosecuting these commitments. Now the county has the authority to prosecute. How does it start? Well, usually law enforcement gets a phone call from someone in the community saying that there's an individual who's behaving in a way which leads them to believe that they have mental health issues and need mental health treatment. Law enforcement responds. They contact human services. And if law enforcement believes that this person needs mental health, tre health treatment, by law they have to offer that person the opportunity to go voluntarily into treatment. Well, what if they don't? Well, then law enforcement has the authority to make them go. And what does law enforcement do? Well, first of all, law enforcement takes them to a facility to make sure they don't have any medical issues, then takes them to a locked inpatient facility, all against their will. The law says you can do that, but as a county, we have to make sure they get their rights, their due process rights. The law says they have to be in front of a judge in 72 hours. The judge is the one that determines whether or not that person was properly taken into custody. That's when my office gets involved. We get notification that someone, someone was detained. My office is responsible for contacting the court, arranging a court date and time, contacting the doctors at the facility, making sure the doctor can testify, making sure law enforcement can testify, human services staff can testify, and members of the public or family members can testify if necessary. You're coordinating a hearing. We also have to contact the public defender's office, make sure the person who's shown up in court has an attorney. We all have to do that within 72 hours. What happens if we do it in 73 hours? Court loses competency to proceed, no jurisdiction, case dismissed. Someone who is in need of treatment goes free 
And that may not be in the best interest of them, seeing that they were detained initially. They may harm themselves. They may harm other people. That has never happened in my office. But it shows you that when we get a referral, everything else stops, and these take priority. Another thing about these mental commitments, these mental health commitments under Chapter 51, there's been a, there was a newspaper article not too long ago in Madison questioning the, the appropriateness of transporting people with mental health, uh, need for mental health treatment in police vehicles. The impact, or the, uh, allude, they were alluding to them being treated like criminals. Well, one th nice thing about what we have here in Jefferson County and the facilities that we use to treat these individuals is that most of them appear by video. They don't need to leave the facility. They appear by video in court. The judge can see them. They can see the judge. They can see all attorneys, and they can see the witnesses. They have a right to be present in court if they want, but they don't have to. So that's the first 72 hours. What happens after that? Well, the county proves its case, and they go back to the facility. We have to do it all over again in 14 days for a final hearing. We have to call the doctors up. Sometimes two doctors testify. We have to call law enforcement if we need them, family members, members of the community, and do it all over again. And if the court finds that the county has proven, uh, met its burden of proof, then we have a final commitment for six months. What happens after six months? Well, they go back to the facility at first, but then they're released out into the community in most cases, living in a group home, living at home, under supervision of, of the Human Services Department, making sure that they're taking their medication, going to their doctor's appointments. But after six months, they still may need to be supervised by Human Services. Then we get contacted and saying, we need to, uh, a request to file a petition to continue the commitment for a year. So we can continue it for a year. And when that year is done, we can continue it for another year if the doctors feel the person isn't safe to be released to the community. So those all involve, involve our office. They all, all involve legal process that we have to follow. And if we don't, then the case has to be dismissed by the judge. That's why these take a priority whenever they come to our office. I'm also going to talk about child support enforcement. I have two attorney, attorneys on my annual report listed on the top, Tan, uh, Tom Antheline and Kendall Wick. They're almost exclusively dedicated to child support enforcement. What do attor two attorneys do on a nearly full-time basis for child support? Well, first of all, you have to establish paternity if there's no parent listed on the birth certificate, no father. Take DNA testing. It's done right here at the courthouse. When the DNA testing comes back, 99.99%, this person's the father. Then you ask a judge to enter an order designating that person as the father. Next step is to order them to pay child support. What if they don't pay child support? Well, that also involves our attorneys. They can be back in front of the judge on contempt of court. Judge can sentence them to jail. Keeps our child support agency busy, and they deal with hundreds of people on a regular basis in this capacity. Another area that keeps my office busy deals with tax foreclosures. It keeps my office busy because last year we foreclosed on 35 tax delinquent properties. The list was a lot bigger, but as we get closer to the date where the county is going to take title of those properties, people pay up. So we got it down to 35, eight with houses or, houses or buildings on that, on the property. Some of the houses were actually occupied by families when the county took title to those properties. So what do you do when you have take title to a house and somebody owns the property and they're living in there? Can you kick them out? Do you make them pay rent? Well, we've done both, but we have to deal with it. Ideally, they contact me and say, I want to buy my house back. What do I need to do? I can work with them. I work with the finance committee. I work with banks to try to get the financing for them to pay back, to pay the county off for their house and they can keep their house. That's the way it often works, but not always. There have been times where I've had to contact law enforcement, and law enforcement has had to contact people living in their houses who wouldn't leave and ask them to leave. Fortunately, it's all been friendly. Nothing's wound up on the news, and I hope that never happens. But uh, they've all been willing to work with us. So that's a good thing. But it does take quite a bit of time for my office to move these forward. We also work with real estate agencies to sell properties that we can't sell through the usual method of publication in the newspaper. So we use various methods to sell the properties, but it's a difficult process because each property is, is, is unique in many situations. Sometimes they're vacant parcels of property, and they're very, to market, very marketable, and we can sell them easily. Sometimes it's the opposite of that, and we have a difficult time selling these properties. But we do what we have to do to market the property the best we can and sell it so we can apply that towards back taxes. Another area that I want to emphasize <coughs> that I dealt with on a number of occasions last year deals with the placement of violent sex offenders in Jefferson County. Violent sex offenders are 
normally, according to the law, they should be placed in their county of residence where they came from. I was in Milwaukee County last year arguing in front of a Milwaukee County judge asking the judge why they placed three violent sex offenders in Jefferson County. Now, these violent sex offenders had done their time in jail. They had gone to treatment at Sand Ridge, and the doctors felt they were able to be released to the community. The state tried to find placement for them in Milwaukee. The state couldn't, but they found placement for them in Jefferson County, so that's where they're living. Judges did not accept my argument and ordered placement in Jefferson County. That's a concern to my office. It's a concern to the district attorney's office, and it's a concern to the sheriff's office. Fortunately, the law has changed. The law now says that if someone commits a crime in a particular county and they're a violent sex offender, they're going back to that county when they get out of treatment. You can't find another county and place them there like they are right now. Unfortunately, it takes a while for the new law to catch up with the cases that are already in the system. That's why we had to deal with these individuals. But eventually, the new law is going to catch up or we're not going to have to worry about this. But we've had a number of, of um, residents placed in Jefferson County who are non-county residents. And the year before, I had been to Racine on two or three different occasions, arguing the same thing to the judge who placed him in Jeff Jefferson County. Wasn't successful either. The law is not on my side. I should say the old law isn't, but the new law is. So that basically highlights some of the things that my office has been working on. You have the report, and it lists a number of, of specific projects that I've been worked on, working on. It goes on and on and on. You can review that on your own. If you have any questions, feel free to get a hold of me. Generally, I want to make sure that the county board is aware that my door is always open. If you ever, ever have any questions, feel free to stop by, call me, or email me. I'm always available. Mr. Chair, I'm available for any questions. Are there any questions? Thank you. All right, thank you. And our final annual report for this evening is District Attorney Sue Happ. Well, good evening, everyone. I see we saved the shortest presenter for last, and I mean that both in terms of my presentation and my stature. <laughs> um, I know you read my annual report. I know most of you. I've, I've worked with in some capacity um, as your district attorney. Um, 2018 was actually my 10th full year as your district attorney, and I'm really proud to have, have served in that capacity for the last 10 years. Um, things are going well. Um, as always, we're extremely busy. Um, something that I looked at, which is different from past presentations, and it's not noted in my report, was kind of looking at um, the chronic turnover that we've seen in district attorney's offices throughout the state. Um, that's due in large part due to the prosecutor shortages that we know that we have. Um, it's also due to the lack of pay progression. And something that I'm really proud of with our office, and I think it speaks volumes about our community and our county, is that I have four full-time uh, assistant district attorneys who have over 46 years of experience between them. Um, and then on top of myself, I have 10 years. So that, that says something. There are a lot of offices around the state who they have someone in there for two to three years, they get a little bit of experience, and they're off to the private sector. Um, so it can be sometimes um, challenging work, it can sometimes be thankless work uh, in terms of um, what we do, but I think part of the reason our prosecutors do stay, um, two of them are from out of county, I have a part-timer who's also from out of county, why they stay in Jefferson County is this is a great place to work, this is a great county to work with, and I think we should all be proud of that. Um, in terms of things that our offices office has seen, um, you've seen a lot of it, the opiate epidemic, of course, remains a challenge for our county and our state. We've also seen an increase in methamphetamine usage uh, in our county, which is of significant concern. It poses similar dangers and challenges uh, as does uh, the heroin in our community. Um, we know we've got to do everything to combat these epidemics, these dangers to our community, and something that, again, we should be very proud of um, that we've done here in, here in our county is we've done more than just prosecute offenders. We've done more than just prosecute users or even the dealers. We've done more than just prosecute uh, the homicides that we see as the aftermath of, this, of these epidemics. What we've done is um, had a really successful um, CJCC, our Community Justice Coordinating Council. Um, it's... Our success in terms of our um, approach to these epidemics has been due in large part to the CJCC, but it's also been due to this county support um, of certain programs related to alternatives to incarceration uh, and this board support, uh, as well as 
Um, we've had just a great uh, county administrator who's been so supportive of the work that we've done. Um, so the use of those diversion programs, you're familiar with our first offender program, but also our, our alcohol treatment court, and certainly now as we see in the annual report, our drug treatment court. We had 26 participants in drug treatment court in 2018. What does that mean for us as citizens? What does that mean for us as taxpayers? If people are in treatment court, they're sober. If people are in treatment court, they're not committing crimes to fuel their habit and they're productive members of society. They're working. Um, so it not only has a human impact in terms of the touch on the lives of the people who are participating, but it has an impact on us as taxpayers because it actually re results in a net benefit to us in terms of the money um, that we've invested into these programs. Um, so I've just been very proud to have uh, the opportunity to work with such a proactive uh, county uh, the board, our administrator, the CJCC, and the law enforcement community. Um, together, it's really been a collaborative effort to help focus on the issues that impact our county and directly impact public safety, which of course is uh, my number one goal as your district attorney. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Are there any questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. <coughs> That concludes annual reports for this evening. We now go to committee reports, resolutions, and ordinances. First, the broadband working group. With a resolution establishing a partnership with Networks Internet LLC to provide a phase one broadband infrastructure and services to underserved areas of Jefferson County. Supervisor Renard. Um, resolution number 2019. One. One. Broadband is often cited as the infrastructure of the future, attracting new business, education, access, residential appeal, and quality of life will be impacted by the availability of a community's broadband service. Jefferson County has parts of the county that are underserved in broadband capabilities. This has been identified as a priority in numerous ways, but most recently through the county strategic plan. To date, the county has been designated as a broadband forward community by the Wisconsin Public Service Commission and created a broadband working group. Further, the county has set aside funds in the 2019 budget to provide matching dollars towards the development of broadband infrastructure, including technical assistance. Networks Internet LLC has expressed an interest to continue to develop broadband infrastructure in Jefferson County and has requested to partner with the county to assist with broadband infrastructure development. Networks Internet currently has a presence in our county to include sponsorship of the Fair Park as well as assisting the town of Watertown in its grant process with the PSC. In coordination with the Broadband Working Group, Networks Internet has developed a plan for phase one of its project, which will provide broadband service to residential, agribusiness, and other businesses in Jefferson County this year. This resolution authorizes Networks Internet to start phase one of this project, which will be a test project with the goal of providing broadband service to approximately 257 residential properties, 13 agribusinesses, 68 other businesses, two multi-dwelling units, and two county facilities. The county's portion of the project is anticipated to be $45,610, with Networks Internet contributing $30,408. The Broadband Working Group considered this resolution at its meeting on April 11th, 2019, and recommended forwarding to the County Board for approval. The Broadband Working Group will continue to develop a phased plan to provide additional coverage across the county, specifically geared towards a 2019 summer grant cycle. These efforts will include working to develop additional partnerships to include working with Dodge County and UW-Whitewater, is the fiscal note. Costs associated with this partnership will be $45,610. Funds have been included in the 2019 budget 
as a contingency line item to implement the strategic plan account number there it is these funds will be transferred into the county administration budget account number you can see that this is a budget amendment county board approval requires a two-thirds vote of the entire membership of the county board 20 votes of the 30 member county board uh, Mr. Chairman, I, uh, motion, I uh, make a motion to approve this resolution. Moved and seconded to establish a partnership with Networks Internet LLC to provide a phase one broadband infrastructure and services to underserved areas of Jefferson County. Discussion? Supervisor Renard. I'd just like to draw your attention to the map on the next page, which shows the project areas that we're talking about. It's the city of Jefferson and much of the um, town of Hebron and surrounding areas. All those little uh, pin uh, um, uh, logos, um, the yellow ones are residential properties. The blue ones, which are sort of over here by Jefferson, are businesses, and the red ones are agribusinesses. So this shows you the, the scope of the project and where it would, will be. Um, the broadband working group was very enthusiastic about the proposal from networks. They um, have been meeting with us and talking to us almost continuously since the broadband working group was created. And they seem very eager to work with us and to um, be collaborative in our efforts to expand the access and affordability of broadband service throughout Jefferson County. Thank you. Other discussion? I suppose we could note that this is uh, the first step and the overall vision is to have all underserved areas in Jefferson County to be served with broadband internet service over time. This is a budget amendment. We'll have a roll call vote. 20 votes are required for adoption. Okay, votes are locked. We have 25 yes, zero no, and five absent. The resolution is adopted. Now to the county administrator with a resolution accepting a bid for one enclosed custom tandem axe trailer for the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office dive team. Mr. Waymeyer, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Before I present the next two resolutions, uh, just a point because I typically do not like to bring things directly to the board as a county administrator as per the board rules. Um, Due to timing and consultation with the chair of the law enforcement committee, um, these things need to get to the county board and miss the uh, law enforcement committee. And we looked at options to reschedule, which um, have a special meeting, which was not going to be able to get facilitated due to timing. So I apologize who would bring this matter, but these things did need to move forward. First one is resolution uh, number 2019-02. It's accepting bids for one enclosed custom tandem axle trailer for the Jefferson County Sheriff's Officer uh, Dive Team. The Jefferson County Sheriff's Office solicited bids from the vendors for the purchase and delivery of one enclosed custom tandem axle trailer with a 12,000 pound gross vehicle weight rating for the purpose of transporting equipment used by the Jefferson County Sheriff's Dive Team. The county administrator re reviewed the bid and recommended for in this resolution the county board accept a bid from LVD Custom Specialty Vehicles as the only bidder at a cost not to exceed $77,454. Fiscal note, funds of 77454 for this project may be allocated in 2019 Sheriff's Office budget account number uh, as presented below. I request that this moves forward. Moved and seconded to accept the bid for one enclosed custom tandem axle trailer for the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office dive team. Discussion? We'll have a roll call vote, please.
Okay, votes are locked. We have 25 yes, zero no, and five absent. The resolution is adopted. Also from the county administrator, a resolution applying for a Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources flood mitigation grant. Mr. Waymeyer, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A resolution, resolution number 2019-03. The Jefferson County Emergency Management Department is requesting the county board authorization to apply for a Wisconsin Department of Natural Resource grant to be used for the acquisition demolition of flood damaged properties in Jefferson County. If awarded, this DNR grant will be combined with other state and federal grant funds from the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program and used to purchase three properties in Fort Atkinson, two on Rock River Road, and one on State Highway 106. Participation in this program by owners of the flood damaged properties is voluntarily. Uh, now, therefore, be resolved that the Emergency Management Director is authorized, hereby authorized to apply for a Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources grant in the amount of up to $10,000 to be applied toward the acquisition and demolition of flood damaged properties in Jefferson County. <laughs> As the fiscal note, the total cost of property acquisition and demolition is $10,000. Funding for flood mitigation properties may be combined with other grant dollars. If any grant dollars remain following these acquisitions, they may be used to purchase additional flood mitigation properties in the future. There will be no tax levy used for these acquisitions. If received, the finance director is authorized to make the necessary budget adjustments. This is a budget adjustment. Uh, county board uh, approval requires a two-thirds vote of the entire membership uh, of the county board. One quick note before we have motions to move this forward. As you note, it is for property acquisition and demolition. Um, this means fair market value. We've got clarification that we can get up to an additional $260,000 for land acquisition. So I request that a amend an amendment is a part of that fiscal note that it should not be $10,000. It should be $270,000. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, can we have a, a motion on the main motion? And a second? Okay, the, we have a motion and second now. Um, the chair requests uh, an amendment to the original motion to change that figure to $270,000. Moved and seconded to amend um, the dollar figure from $10,000 to $270,000. First, we'll vote on the amendment. Is there any discussion on the amendment? Does the amendment require 20 votes? Okay, we can have a voice vote on the amendment. All in favor of the amendment, changing it from $10,000 to $270,000, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Okay, now we're to the main motion um, with the updated figure. Is there any discussion? We'll have a roll call vote. 20 votes are required for adoption. The votes are locked. 25 yes, zero no, five absent. The resolution is adopted. Now to the executive committee with a resolution entering into a memorandum of understanding with the City of Oconomowoc and the Oconomowoc Library Board. Supervisor Renard, please. Resolution number 2019-4. Jefferson County, working with the Jefferson County Library Board, administers a non-countywide tax levy to support libraries based on use by residents. Jefferson County provides funds to libraries within the county and is required by law to reimburse adjacent counties for use of their libraries by Jefferson County residents at a minimum of 70% of their circulation costs. The Oconomowoc Library receives the majority of these funds due to its proximity to Jefferson County and being the closest library for residents in northeast Jefferson County, including the Oconomowoc area. Due to the growth of this area, the use of the Oconomowoc Library by Jefferson County residents continues to increase. Under state law, counties have the authority to appoint members to local library boards to represent their interests with county membership based on the proportion of county funding. However, this statute only applies to library boards with libraries located in the county. As a result, Jefferson County does not have the statutory authority to appoint members to the Oconomowoc Library Board. The county administrator and the Bridges Library System director met with representatives of the City of Oconomowoc and its library board 
to discuss representation of Jefferson County on the Oconomowoc Library Board based on the funding provided by the county and the library's use by Jefferson County residents. This memorandum of understanding authorizes Jefferson County Administrator to appoint an ex officio member to the Oconomowoc Library Board to represent the interests of Jefferson County. The Executive Committee considered this resolution at its meeting on March 27, 2019 and recommended forwarding to the County Board for approval. And fiscal note, standard mileage and per diem rates would apply to this appointment and be charged to the Library Administration budget. I move approval of this resolution. Moved and seconded uh, to enter into a memorandum of understanding with the City of Oconomowoc and the Oconomowoc Library Board. Discussion. Supervisor Renard. The, um, the City of Oconomowoc Common Council already has approved this memorandum of understanding. Um, many of the users of the Oconomowoc Library come from my district and um, the um, town of Concord. A lot of uh, the town of Exonia and the town of Concord lies within the Oconomowoc School District, and that's why the use of the Oconomowoc Library is very high in those areas. Last year, Jefferson County paid to the Oconomowoc Library right around $90,000 which is a lot. So you can see why it would be in our interest to have a voice on their board and also in their interest to talk about the money. And I just want to also point out that uh, under the terms of the Memorandum of Understanding, um, the ex officio member will be appointed for three years, but after one year, the parties will reconvene to think about whether they want to continue it. So there's li a little bit of an out for us too if we decide it's not productive, but I'm, I'm hoping it will be a very productive way for us to um, represent the interests of our residents at the Oconomowoc Public Library. Thank you. Further discussion? Voice vote, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The resolution is adopted. Now to the Finance Committee with a resolution amending the 2019 Jefferson County Parks Department budget. Supervisor Jones, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Resolution number 2019-5. As part of segment one of the construction of a multi-use recreational trail from Watertown to Oconomowoc, known as the Interurban Recreational Trail, a bridge was constructed and installed over the Rock River by R River Road in Watertown. During the installation of the bridge, the trail from River Road to the bridge sustained damage from the equipment used to install the bridge. As a result, the trail is in need of repair, and We Energies, owner of the trail right away, requested that such repair include paving the connection between River Road and the recently installed bridge, which is consistent with the trail plan. Because the installation of the bridge was more costly than anticipated, the funds originally budgeted for the paving project were used for the installation of the bridge. Reserve funds committed for parks projects by the Carroll Little Estate have been included in the 2019 budget in the amount of $84,230.45, but they are not designated for any particular project. Using these funds as a pros re proposed requires a budget amendment. This resolution amends the Park Department budget to authorize the Park Department to utilize these funds to pave the trail connection from River Roads to the bridge. The Finance Committee considered this resolution at its meeting on April 11, 2019 and recommended forwarding to the county budget for approval. Fiscal note. This is a budget amendment that transfers funds from account 12802.699800 Care a Little Reserve Applied Capital to account 12810.699800 Urban Bike Trail Reserve Applied Capital in the amount of $84,230.45. No tax levy is required for this request. County Board approval requires a two-third vote of the entire membership of the County Board, 20 votes of the 30-member County Board. Mr. Chair, I move for passage of this resolution. Moved and seconded to amend the 2019 Jefferson County Parks Department budget. Discussion. Supervisor Mode. I just have one question. We're transferring the eighty-four thousand some dollars. Is that the actual cost of the paving, or is it? Mr. Namer, would you please address the question? It's anticipated that the total cost will be in the forty to fifty thousand dollar range. 
Okay, thank you. Further discussion? It's a budget amendment. 20 votes are required for adoption. We'll have a roll call vote, please. Okay, votes are locked. We have 25 yes, zero no, and five absent. The resolution is adopted. Now to the Highway Committee with a resolution approving 2019 asphalt pulverizing and milling quotes. Supervisor Christensen, please. Thank you. I have resolution number 2019-6. On March 20, 2019, the Highway Department received quotes from area vendors for asphalt pulverizing and milling. The Highway Department schedules all projects to work on site with the selected vendor. The vendor selected by the county will be determined by the location of the project and the plant location to obtain the best price for each project. This resolution authorizes the Jefferson County Highway Department to accept the seasonal quotes for 2019 from all the vendors listed below utilizing the lowest price vendor unless the vendor cannot meet the project schedule of the department, in which case the next lowest priced vendor shall be used. The Highway Committee met on March 26, 2019 and recommended forwarding this resolution to the County Board for approval. <coughs> Fiscal note, funds have been allocated in 2019 Highway Maintenance Account Number 53311 and Highway Construction Account Number 53312. Mr. Chairman, I move for adoption of this resolution. Second. Moved and seconded to approve 2019 asphalt pulverizing and milling quotes. Discussion. Roll call vote, please. Okay, <coughs> votes are locked. 25 yes, zero no, five absent. The resolution is adopted. Now a resolution approving 2019 local road improvement program asphalt bid. Supervisor Christensen. Thank you. I have resolution number 2019-7. The Jefferson County Highway Department obtains funding through the Wisconsin Department of Transportation local road improvement program for, selected, for select projects. For 2019, Jefferson County bid one project that includes funding from WISDOT in the LRIP program for asphalt material purchase. This resolution awards the asphalt bid for the 2019 Local Road Improvement Program project for Jefferson County on County Highway CI, which is South 106 to County Trunk Highway Z, to Payne and Dolan Incorporated. The Highway Committee met on March 26, 2019, and recommended forwarding this resolution to the Board for approval. Fiscal note, the Wisconsin Department of Transportation requires asphalt purchase projects through the Local Road Improvement Program to be awarded to a paving contractor. The funds for asphalt purchases will come from the Highway Construction Account 53312 and the Wisconsin Department of Transportation LRIP funds. I move for adoption of this resolution. Moved and seconded to approve 2019 Local Road Improvement Program asphalt bid. Discussion. Supervisor Kennard. Yeah, I'll, I'll vote no on this because I don't like the projects as presented before. Uh, I think there's roads in, in more need. Uh, money could be spent, you know, uh, people get get more, more get words in road shape. There are roads in worse shape than these that need paving. Thank you. Further discussion? Roll call vote, please. Okay, votes are locked and frozen. Oh, there we go. Okay, we have 24 yes, one no, and four absent. The resolution is adopted. Next, a resolution from the Highway Committee approving 2019 pre mixed hot mix asphalt vendor quotes. Surprise, Christensen. Thank you. I have resolution number 2019 8. On March 20, 2019, the Highway Department received quotes from all area vendors for pre-mixed asphalt. The Highway Department purchases the asphalt from vendors and delivers the material to the job site for placement by county crews. 
The vendor selected by the county will be determined by the location of the project and the plant location to obtain the best price for each project. This resolution authorizes the Jefferson County Highway Department to purchase pre-mixed asphaltic concrete products at the prices listed below from any of the asphalt vendors in 2019. The Highway Committee met on 20, March 26, 2019 and recommended forwarding this resolution to the County Board for approval. You see the amounts uh, listed below. Fiscal note. The Highway Department will determine the best price for each project as asphalt, asphalt price plus trucking when selecting a plant location. The Department will also consider plant schedule, availability, and production rates. Funds have been allocated in 2019 Highway Maintenance Account number 53311 and Highway Construction Account number 53312. Mr. Chairman, I move for adoption of this resolution. Moved and seconded to approve 2019 pre-mixed hot mix asphalt vendor quotes discussion. Roll call vote, please. Okay, votes are locked. We have 25 yes, zero no, and five absent. The resolution is adopted. Finally, from the Highway Committee, a resolution approving 2019, there's a bit of a typo there, meant to say seal coat oil vendor bids. Supervisor Christensen, Mr. please. Chair, I request to be excused. I have a meeting at 7 o'clock in my town, and I'm also a supervisor there, so I need to go. Thank you, Supervisor Zaster. Supervisor Christensen, thank, you can proceed. Thank you. I have resolution number 2019-9. On March 20, 2019, the Highway Department received bids from area vendors for seal coat emulsions. The contractor provides the emulsions and transportation to the county job sites. Vendors selected by the county will be determined by the location of the project and the plant location to obtain the best price for each project. This resolution authorizes the Jefferson County Highway Department to purchase emulsion product, products from the vendors listed below at the stated bid prices. The Highway Committee met on March 26, 2019 and recommended forwarding this resolution to the County Board for approval. Fiscal note. The funds to come from Highway Maintenance Account 53311 and the Highway Construction Account 53312. I move for adoption of this resolution. Moved and seconded to approve 2019 seal coat oil vendor bids. Discussion. Roll call vote, please. Okay, votes are locked. We have 24 yes, zero no, and six absent. Resolution is adopted. How are we doing? Anybody need a break? No. Okay, let's, Chair, I got a. Let's, let's take. Um, Six minutes until quarter to eight, or quarter to seven, I'm sorry. Six minute break. I'm gonna leave to go to my town. Okay, thank you. Supervisor Kennard will be leaving. Back to order. And the first thing we're gonna do, because we do have an item left on the agenda that requires 20 votes for adoption, so we will determine that we have at least 20 members present. I believe that we have 21 or 22. 22. I don't count. 22 members present. Okay. Returning to committee reports, resolutions, and ordinances, we now go to the Human Resources Committee with a resolution creating a full-time building maintenance worker one position in the Central Services Department. Supervisor Brogler, please. Resolution 2019-10. Currently, the Central Service staff is responsible for maintaining and providing oversight of capital projects to the Jefferson County Courthouse, MIS facility, County Jail and Sheriff buildings, including the Sheriff's main office, range, and annex buildings. In addition to the administration, administrative long-term strategic planning and capital project planning functions. The specific daily needs include building maintenance and custodial services, fundamental repairs, carpentry and electrical services to building, snow removal, assuring other pedestrian 
walkway safety issues, conference room setup and takedown, interdepartmental mail services, and being on call 24-7 for emergencies at the jail. At present, the central service staff consists of one director of maintenance, one building and maintenance foreman, one building maintenance worker, two, one central service worker, and three custodians, two full-time and one funded part-time. The director of maintenance position has been vacant since May 2017, and the daily administrative, supervisory, and project management tasks were delegated to a maintenance worker who was reclassified to a foreman position. After assuming these duties, the foreman now spends less than half of his time on the daily general maintenance of the facilities. In addition, there's only two staff available to be on call 365 days of the year. With the director position vacant, the creation of a full-time building maintenance worker one position will provide the staffing needed to perform routine and preventative maintenance to buildings and grounds to assure the safety of citizens, visitors, and employees. The new Building Maintenance Worker 1 position will also be included in the 24-7 on-call rotation and be able to provide flexibility and custodial coverage in the evenings. Attempts have been made to recruit limited-term staff and contracted staff to assist with the ongoing, unfinished, and on-hold projects. However, the inability to retain and lack of consistency have made these efforts unsuccessful. On March 25, 2019, the Human Services Committee reviewed the request from the County Administrator and recommended forwarding this resolution to the County Board to create one full-time building maintenance position one position in the Central Services Department. Fiscal note. This resolution amends the budget by funding the building maintenance worker one position and defunding the director of maintenance position. This is a budget adjustment. County Board approval requires two-thirds votes of the entire membership of the County Board, 20 of the 30 members. I move for passage. It's moved and seconded to create a full-time building maintenance worker one position in the Central Services Department. Discussion? We'll have a roll call vote. 20 votes are required for adoption. Okay, your votes are locked. We have 22 yes, zero no, and eight absent. The resolution is adopted. Now to the Parks Committee. With a resolution accepting donation of a two acre parcel of property to expand Indian Mounds and Trail Park near Fort Atkinson. Supervisor Teets, please. Resolution number 2019 11. Accepting donation of a two-acre parcel of property expand Indian Mounds and Trail Park near Fort Atkinson. Indian Mounds Park is a Jefferson County Park located on the Koshkan Mounds Road south of Fort Atkinson. This five-acre park offers visitors the opportunity to view 11 Indian effigy mounds, which include symmetrical and animal shapes built by Native Americans between 60, 650 and 1200 A.D. These mounds are believed to have served ceremonial, spiritual, and practical purpose for Native Americans. Gary, Jill, and David Gramley have generously offered to donate to Jefferson County approximately two acres of their land adjoining Indian Mounds Park, which also has Indian effigy mounds. By accepting this donation and expanding Indian Mounds Park, Jefferson County will be able to ensure that these Indian effigy mounds will be permanently protected and preserve a valuable Native American heritage for future generations. The Parks Committee met on April 1, 2019 and recommended forwarding this resolution to the County Board to accept the offer to donate approximately two acres of property to expand Indian mound parts to Fort Atkinson. Fiscal note, this is a gift to Jefferson County there is no physical fiscal impact. I move to approve the resolution. Second. Moved and second to accept donation of a two-acre parcel of property to expand Indian Mounds and Trail Park near Fort Atkinson. Discussion? All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Resolution is adopted. Also from the Parks Committee, a resolution authorizing Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources Stewardship Program 
Federal Recreation Trails Program, and Land and Water Conservation Fund grant applications and acceptance. Supervisor Teets, please. Resolution number 2019-12, authorizing Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources Stewardship Program, Federal Recreational Trail Program, and Land and Water Conservation Fund, LAWCON, grant application and acceptance. <clears throat> the Jefferson County Parks Department is in process of constructing a recreation trail for hiking, biking, and cross-country skiing, skiing on the right-of-way owned by We Energies. The proposed trail is 10.96 miles in length and is located between the city of Watertown, Wisconsin and the city of Oconomowoc, Wisconsin. This off-road paved trail connection will be built on the former interurban rail line that connects the city of Watertown to the city of Oconomowoc. The path cross section will consist of 10 foot wide asphalt surface with two foot wide aggregate shoulders. An eight inch stone base with three inch asphalt layer will be used. The project is located primarily in Jefferson County, 10 miles, and a portion in Waukesha County, one mile. The old interurban line, which at one time connected the city of Watertown with the city of Milwaukee is now a utility corridor owned by We Energies, which has granted a license to use the property as a recreation trail. This resolution authorizes the county administrator to apply for and if awarded to accept these grant funds for the purpose of construction of the second segment of the recreational trail. The Parks Committee considered this resolution as a meeting on April 1, 2019, and recommends forwarding it to the county board for approval. <clears throat> Fiscal note, if the county is awarded the stewardship grant described above, the finance director is authorized to increase budget accounts 12810.421099 bike trails capital state aid and 12810.594829 bike trails capital improvement. In the amount of the up to the grant award not to exceed $511,464. No tax levy is required for this request. This is a budget amendment. County Board approval requires a two thirds vote of the entire membership of the County Board, 20 votes of the 30 member County Board. I move for passage. Moved and seconded to authorize the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources Stewardship Program, Federal Recreational Trails Program and Land and Water Conservation Fund grant applications and acceptance. Discussion. Roll call vote, please. 20 votes are required for adoption. Okay, votes are locked. We have 22 yes, zero no, and eight absent. Resolution is adopted. Now to the Planning and Zoning Committee with the report on approval of petitions and the ordinance amending the zoning <coughs> ordinance. Supervisor Nass, please. Report to honorable members of Jefferson County Board of Supervisors. Planning and the Jefferson County Planning and Zoning Committee have considered the petitions to amend the official zoning map of Jefferson County filed for public hearing on December 19, 1996, November 15, 2018, March 14, 2019, as required by law pursuant to Wisconsin statutes. Notice there haven't been given and being duly advised of the wishes of the town boards and persons in the areas affected. Hereby makes the following recommendations. The approval of petitions as listed below. Dated this day, 18th of March, 2019, Blaine Paulson, Secretary. Ordinance number 2019-1, I believe, correct? I move for the uh, pass of this ordinance as printed. Second. Moved and seconded to amend the zoning ordinance as printed. Discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ordinance is amended. Now, appointments by the county administrator, there are four of them. Mr. Waymire. Thank you, Mr. Chair. By virtue of the authority of SB 51.182B of the Wisconsin State Statute, I respectfully request confirmation of the following appointments. Mr. Bill Kern as Highway Commissioner for a two-year term ending May 31st, 2021. Joanne Larson to the Land Information Council to serve as Real Estate Rep for a three-year term ending June 30th, 2022. Mr. Todd Linder to the Land Information Council to serve as a Public Safety Rep for a three-year term ending June 30th, 2022. And Mr. Dick Schultz, Fort Atkinson to the Board of Health for a three-year term ending May 10th, 2022. I respectfully request confirmation of these appointments. 
Moved and seconded to confirm the appointments. Discussion? All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. The appointments are confirmed. Now appointments by the County Board Chair. I, Jim Schrader, Chairman of the County Board of Supervisors, Jefferson County, Wisconsin, as the appointing authority for standing committees, hereby appoint Daryl Falk, Transportation Representative to the Local Emergency Planning Committee for an indeterminate term, replacing Ryan Leslie, and reappointing Jim Mode to the Jefferson County Economic Development Consortium for a three-year term ending May 1, 2022. I respectfully request board confirmation. Moved and seconded to confirm the appointments. Discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The appointments are confirmed. Now we have uh, several proclamations. The first one coming from the Law Enforcement and Emergency Management Committee proclaiming the week of April 14th through April 27, 2019 as National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week. Supervisor Morris, please. Must be Proclamation 2019-01. Yes. Whereas emergencies can occur at any time that require police, fire, or emergency medical services, and whereas when an emergency occurs, the prompt response of police officers, firefighters, and emergency medical technicians is critical to the protection of life and preservation of property. And whereas the safety of our police officers and firefighters is dependent upon the quality and accuracy of information obtained from citizens who telephone the communication centers at Jefferson County Sheriff's Office, the Fort Atkinson Police Department, the Watertown Police Department, the Whitewater Police Department, the City of Jefferson Police Department, the City of Lake Mills Police Department, and the City of Waterloo Police Department. And whereas public safety telecommunicators are the first and most critical contact citizens have with emergency services, and whereas public safety telecommunicators are the single vital link for police officers and firefighters by monitoring their activities by radio, providing them information, and ensuring their safety, and whereas public safety telecommunicators in Jefferson County have contributed substantially to the apprehension of criminals, suppression of fires, and treatment of patients, and whereas dispatchers have exhibited compassion, understanding, and professionalism during the performance of their job duties, now therefore be it resolved that the Jefferson County Board of Supervisors declares the week of April 14 through April 20, 2019 to be National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week in Jefferson County in honor of the men and women whose diligence and professionalism keep our country and citizens safe. I move for this proclamation. Second. Moved and seconded to proclaim the week of April 14th through 27th, 2019 as National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week. Discussion? All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Proclamation is adopted. Now a proclamation coming from the Jefferson County Economic Development Consortium proclaiming April as Fair Housing Month in Jefferson County. Supervisor Mode, please. Proclamation 2019-02 <clears throat> proclaiming April as Fair Housing Month in Jefferson County, whereas 2019 is the 51st anniversary of the passage of the Title VIII of the Civil Rights Act of 1968, known as the Federal Fair Housing Act, and Wisconsin is celebrating the 54th anniversary of the Wisconsin Open Housing Law, and whereas in recognition of the anniversary of the Fair Housing Act, the month of April has been designated as National Fair Housing Month to emphasize the importance of ending housing discrimination and ensuring that every American has access to housing that is free from discrimination. And whereas fair housing occurs when people have a wide range of housing choices based on their income and needs regardless of race, color, sex, sexual orientation, religion, national origin, ancestry, age, marital status, lawful source of income, disability, family status, or status as a victim of domestic abuse, sexual abuse, or stalking. 
I will therefore be it resolved that the Jefferson County Board of Supervisors hereby proclaims the month of April 29th as Fair Housing Month in Jefferson County to emphasize the importance of ending housing discrimination and ensuring that every American has access to housing that is free from discrimination. Fiscal note, adoption of this proclamation has no fiscal impact. Mr. Chairman, I move for the adoption of this proclamation. Second. Moved and seconded to proclaim April as Fair Housing Month in Jefferson County. Discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The proclamation is adopted. And also a proclamation proclaiming the month of April as Alcohol Awareness Month coming from the Board of Health. Supervisor Schultz, please. I, I won't read all of the whereas, as there are a lot of them in this one. I believe this is Proclamation 2019-03, although there's nothing at top of the, okay. Um, whereas Alcohol Awareness Month was established in 1987 to help reduce the stigma so often associated with alcohol addiction by encouraging communities to reach out to the American public each April with information about alcohol, alcohol addiction and recovery and where, whereas Alcohol Awareness Month provides an opportunity to de decrease stigma and misunderstandings in order to dismantle the barriers to treatment and recovery and thus make seeking uh, help more readily available for those who suffer from this disease and whereas alcohol addiction is a chronic progressive disease genetically predisposed and fatal if untreated. Um, I'm going to go on to now therefore be it resolved that the Jefferson County Board of Supervisors not only discourages the use of alcohol by those below the legal age of con uh, cons consumption, but also encourages all residents to refuse to provide alcoholic beverages to those under the legal age for consuming alcohol and pledges to support all law enforcement efforts to identify uh, and deter this illegal unhealthy activity be it further resolved that the Jefferson County Board of Supervisors hereby by proclaim the month of April 2019 to be Alcohol Awareness Month with an emphasis on preventing the consumption of alcohol by those under the legal age, drinking age. Fiscal note, adoptions procl proclamation has no fiscal impact. Mr. Chairman, I move adoption of this proclamation. Moved and seconded to proclaim the month of April as Alcohol Awareness Month in Jefferson County. Discussion. Supervisor Schultz. Yes, I, and I, this is not a controversial issue, I don't think. Um, so it's not like we need to really debate, but I, I do want to give a little anecdotal information here. 30 years ago, I worked as a foster parent. That was 30 years ago. Um, and dealt with a lot of alcohol issues and other drug-related issues, but it always seems to start with alcohol. Now, fast forward 30 years, and those, those boys uh, would be in their 40s if they were still alive. Of the five or six boys that I've had, two are dead, and one is only alive because he survived his attempted suicide. This is a serious problem. This is a critical problem. I urge everybody to adopt this resolution and to look at what we can do as individuals to, to address this problem. Thank you. Further discussion? Proclaiming the month of April as Alcohol Awareness Month, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The proclamation is adopted. Now we're to pro public comment of a general nature. Are there any registrants? Would any member of the public wish to address the board at this time? Okay, are there any announcements? Any announcements? Mr. Waymire. I'd like to take the podium if you don't mind. You may, sir. So we had a retiree sneak in that we we're going to try to take care of earlier. So we're going to make sure we do this properly. So we've actually tried to do this a few times because the first time we passed a resolution for our outgoing clerk of court when we had a little snowstorm that occurred in January and then we rescheduled that meeting. And uh, she moved on to her retirement gig, which is running a catering company. And she happened to have a tasting, I believe, that night for a wedding or something like that. So that was a little more fun than having a, a county board meeting, I guess. So a couple things I want to quick do is, of all the department heads, 
an unknown fact probably is I probably have known Carl the longest of any of them. And the reason why is when I was a little bit younger, an undergrad at UW-Whitewater, I actually did an internship here in the DA's office for DA Wambach at the time. And guess who kind of was my quasi-supervisor when I was writing up the charging sheets? It was Carla. And so um, when I was being interviewed, all of a sudden I saw this face. I'm like, you look really familiar. And lo and behold, it was Carla. Um, and it's, it's a very small world as things come around. So she has the distinction of the department head. I've known the longest. So here's a resolution that we did. And we'll just quick read it as a reminder of uh, why we are here. Uh, whereas Carla J. Robinson served in the district attorney's office commencing February 10, 1992 until her election as the Jefferson County Clerk of Circuit Court. And whereas Carla J. Robinson served as the Jefferson County Clerk of Circuit Court for Jefferson County commencing January 1, 2007 until January 6, 2019, where she served 12 years for a combined total uh, of 27 years of dedicated public service to Jefferson County. And whereas uh, Carla J. Robinson has unselfishly devoted herself to making Jefferson County a better place in which to live and work. And whereas G Carla J. Robinson has demonstrated integrity and professionalism in the administration of her duties that serves as a guide for all she came in contact with. And whereas is fitting for her recognition by the Jefferson County Board of Supervisors for her public service and devotion to her chosen profession. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Jefferson County Board of Supervisors does hereby honor the clerk of court, uh, uh, Carla, Carla J. Robinson, for her many years of service to Jefferson County and wish her well in retirement. So this is the resolution that we passed um, back in February, uh, it appears. So there's a lot to say about Carla. And as we look at what she did in office, I think uh, the judges would uh, echo these comments. And you heard Cindy talk about this a little bit earlier tonight. And the court system itself has gone through a lot of transformation. A lot of it's from a technical standpoint, electronic records. So an example we often use, we look at the old space study, and I don't know how much space the clerk of court office was gonna have for paper storage, but it was basically doubling this building, I think, in one of the studies. But point being, that space is no longer needed. Um, we're actually um, working in, on a project I'll take away a space saver system to gain more space for a courthouse because lo and behold, we're, we're e-filing. We're putting all these things on record so it's easier to find. That is one example. Cindy talked about the collection system that Carla started as well. A way for us to get increased revenue, get the people uh, who are owed the court and the county the money, a way to pay it. Uh, with them, it's the cost back to the county. We can use those funds back to what it needed was meant to be for the state and the county. So there's a lot of things we can talk through. So we have a variety of goodies for Carla tonight. So the first is that resolution, a nice little plaque. The second is the mandatory certificate that she gets. And then finally, because of her time in service, is um, the little nicer plaque that we put together for all the employees recently. So thank you again, Carla, for all your service and the time together. So. Thank you very much. I just want to share that um, when Ben came up to me at the um, meet and greet when we were in the hiring process. I had no clue who he was. <laughs> I still don't remember him in an internship role because we had so many interns when um, DA Wambach was the um, district attorney that they just rolled in and out of there and I do not remember him to this day as an intern. So, <laughs> um, But I have loved my time here at the county and I think I accomplished all the things that I set out to do as the clerk of court and was able to turn it over to um, a successor that I built up through there, and I hope that she carries on the torch um, and continues to make the clerk of courts in Jefferson County better as we move forward. Thank you. Best to you in your retirement. Thank you. I just changed careers. I really did not. <laughs> <laughs> Any other announcements this evening? Just a reminder that our next county board meeting will return to regular order, second Tuesday of the month at 7 p.m. in May.